Hello, everyone, and a very good evening to you all. This is Shama, your host for the evening. Super thrilled to welcome you all to the fifth edition of the Product Leadership Festival Data Analytics AI Edition. Product Leadership Festival is a global knowledge sharing event organized by the Institute of Product Leadership, inviting speakers across the globe for nurturing and growing product data strategy and leadership communities in the country. This is a 10 day festival folks till the 19th of November. And as you can see on the slide, we have 10 influential world renowned AI leaders sharing actionable insights via impactful keynote sessions that will help catapult your career paths. We are on the day five with five more speakers to go in the coming week. The keynotes are designed to build your acumen and knowledge in data science and explore the emerging practices and applications of data science to create innovative human-centered AI products and systems. For those who have missed out uh, on the product strategy, art of storytelling and digital product management edition organized this year or the festival organized last year, uh, please uh, click on the link in the chat window to uh, watch videos of 50 plus distinguished speakers sharing their key learnings and actionable insights in uh, product data design and leadership. Encouraging you all to share it within your network and inspire others to join and learn. Now, before we dive into today's insightful session, let me give you a quick intro to the Institute. The Institute of Product Leadership is Asia's first business school, providing accredited degree programs and certification courses in product management, product leadership, strategy, data, design, and uh, analytics. The Institute has partnered with three universities in India and the University of Houston in the United States. The Institute was founded in 2012 with the singular mission of creating 10,000 product leaders in the country. Ever since, the organization has designed and delivered programs in collaboration with various institutes, universities, and corporates to the senior working professionals to help them make the transition into product leadership roles. You can find out all about the Institute and the programs offered on our website. Please check the chat window for the URL. Folks, IPS School of Data Science offers multiple programs in data, AI, ML analytics. Every program is created and curated by industry CXOs with case studies, simulations, real life projects, assessments, and personalized coaching. Scan the QR code to take a simple assessment to know your data science aptitude and which program suits your career aspirations. Give me a moment here to scan the QR code. You can find the link to the same in the chat room. Now here's some exciting news for all the attendees here tonight. Thanks to the University of Houston, you have an opportunity to win the prestigious Taylor Scholarship of $200 for the newly launched International Certification in Data Science and Business Analytics program offered by the IPL School of Data Science. The best asked question in tonight's session will get this reward. So once a speaker for tonight presents his insights, we'll open up for questions. Please keep your questions ready. You can ask questions on Zoom in the Q&A section. This session is being streamed live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So viewers on any of these channels, please, please feel free to post your questions in the comment section and we'll share it with the speaker. Do not miss out on this opportunity folks, engage with our speaker with some good intriguing questions and win the Taylor Scholarship. Now coming to tonight's session, please allow me to welcome Abhilash Shah, the moderator of this session. Abhilash is based in Manchester and he's currently working as product manager for uh, On The Beach, which is UK's largest European travel uh, beach holiday company. Abhilash is an inquisitive product manager who believes in empathizing with the customers to uncover their real pains and challenges. He's passionate about building products that craft great customer experiences and solve their real problems. Abhilash truly believes in continuous uh, discovery, repetitive experimentation, and taking data-driven decisions to build the right product. Abhilash is a proud alumni of the Institute pursuing the EMBA program in product leadership. Great to have you here with us, Abhilash. Handing the session over to you now. Thank you very much, Shama, for that introduction. Welcome, everyone. Thanks, thanks for taking your time and making it, uh, especially when it's Friday evening. I'm sure we are going to have a very exciting session today and some great learnings as well. 
on this uh, new trend of human in the loop in machine learning from a very well-known veteran data scientist. It's my absolute privilege to introduce you today's speaker, Keith McCormick, to you all. Keith McCormick is an independent data miner, trainer, conference speaker, and author. He's an instructor in UC Irvine's Predictive Analytics Certificate Program, has more than a dozen of courses on LinkedIn learning platform as well, and is a frequent speaker at conference like Predictive Analytics World and TDWI, both in US and overseas. Over 25 years, he has guided data science teams to establish highly effective practices across industries, including public sector, media, marketing, healthcare, retail, finance, manufacturing, and healthcare and higher education. He also serves as Cloud Factory's chief data science advisor. And that role will be more of the focus of today's talk. So I would like to welcome Keith. Welcome, Keith. Thanks so much. Thanks for that introduction. Keith, uh, I also have an initial question, you know, before we transition into today's keynote. Hmm. I understand that you've been in Cloud Factory role for almost exactly a year. And That's I've right. been very keen and would like to know what you have seen and learned in this year about where the AI and ML is headed. So would you like to talk about it? Well, uh, yes, and, and thank you for uh, asking that. I think it's a nice way to make a transition into the into the talk. You know, I originally was going to title this talk uh, "Things I've Learned So Far" to really emphasize that I've actually learned a lot in the last twelve months. And the reason is, is that working in you know application areas like manufacturing, banking, insurance, these are all traditional machine learning and data mining areas it, where we do things more like we did in the 80s and 90s than I think a lot of people realize, you know, that, that we have established processes, you know, that, that we do in traditional machine learning. But one of the themes that I'm going to explore in the talk is that things changed radically um, after 2012. I'm going to explain why. And that's the world that Cloud Factory lives in. Um, drones and autonomous vehicles. And I, and I think it's um, I'm, I'm guessing that for most folks in the audience, it's as new to them as it has been to me over the last 12 months in that we see it in the news, we see it on LinkedIn, but most of us aren't working for companies that are building autonomous vehicles. You know, we're doing other things. So connecting what we know about data science to these exciting areas that are sometimes just beyond our grasp, but that we hear about and talk about every day uh, is just a very interesting topic. And it's been an interesting journey for me over the last 12 months. That's great. Good to know that. Over to you. So um, I think what would be fun to do, and I want to caution everybody as we do this, that there's no expectation that you already know a thing about Hewn in the Loop, right? So if you saw the title and you're intrigued, but you're wondering, wow, uh, I'm not even sure what this phrase is, that there's a, a poll that I had conducted recently on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, if you could just kind of check this out, the whole notion is even among folks that are familiar with data science and machine learning, what's the familiarity with this particular phrase, human in the loop? And by the way, we're gonna save plenty of time for questions at the end. So you'll be able to ask follow-up questions about this. And in the, around the middle of my presentation, you'll see um, that uh, you'll be able to get some results from, uh, from others as well. It looks like we're already getting pretty good participation. Maybe give that another minute or two. I think this is a fun way to start things off. And again, it will be especially fun for me to compare. Uh, kind of jot down the, the quick pattern here that's starting to emerge because we'll see a slide in the middle of the talk on a poll that was up for a couple of weeks on LinkedIn. What do you think? Is that almost everybody? Yeah, that should be good, Keith. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do is, so everybody, just take a quick glance at those numbers. We're going to, uh, we're going to, uh, we can share the poll for about thirty seconds, let's say, out to everybody, and then I will launch the uh, slide deck. 
And most common answers are critical for some applications as in what is human in the loop. And we will return to this uh, when, we, uh, when we get in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and start with the slides. Some reason it's not popping up as one of my options. Bear with me for a moment. Sure, no problem. Oh, there the same is. survey and the poll question that you conducted on LinkedIn. What was yeah, so it'll, be, it'll really be fun to compare the two. Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, so I apologize for the brief delay there. Uh, as anyone who's uh, uh, presented on Zoom before, you preferably don't want to share the whole desktop, but rather just the application. But I think we are all set. So I'm going to jump right in. You already know uh, quite a bit about me. Let me pause here for just a moment, tell you a little bit about Cloud Factory. So what I'm really talking about today is human in the loop and not specifically Cloud Factory. But um, what happened is about a year ago, I discovered that this really interesting company is right in my own neck of the woods in Durham, North Carolina. And I think like so many folks during COVID, despite the stress that has been associated with this um, surprise that has been thrown upon the world over the last uh, year and a half, is that I think a lot of us have reintroduced ourselves to our neighborhoods because we're home more. <laughs> and that certainly has happened to me. So I didn't know that Cloud Factory was 20 minutes from my home here. Um, and once I encountered them, I just became fascinated and wanted to be associated with them in some way. So I basically have an evangelist type role where I work with the, with the marketing team and kind of help educate both internally and externally about what's going on in industry trends, which is uh, something that really dovetails beautifully with the other work that I do. But what Cloud Factory is, is a managed workforce so what we're going to be talking about is how deep learning has created this huge demand for very large supervised data sets where supervised data sets has, have not previously existed, like video of cars driving around and so on, right? And then in order to do that, you really need humans. And that's what Cloud Factory does. We have a very large presence in both Nepal and in Kenya, uh, where these uh, folks work, and we'll have more to say about that. But that's the, the quick version of what Cloud Factory is all about. It's a managed workforce, and we're really trying to create change in these communities as well, making a long-term commitment to the communities. And then in turn, uh, the folks that work with Cloud Factory, in many cases, work with Cloud Factory for years, which um, uh, everybody has found very rewarding. So first of four themes, okay? The first of four themes is going to be that deep learning is driving all of this. Deep learning is driving the need for this. Deep learning has changed everything, okay? So let's begin at the beginning, okay? And that's with ImageNet. Now, ImageNet may or may not be familiar to you. It's become kind of famous, certainly Fei-Fei Li here giving um, a, a really powerful TED Talk, by the way, something that you could put on your to-do list after um, our talk today is to check this out about the history of ImageNet. But you wanna think of ImageNet in two respects. One is that it's a database. It's a database specifically of labeled images. You know, the classic, is this a cat or is it a dog type task uh, that has become almost, uh, you know, something that we all find, you know, kind of humorous because we've grown familiar with it. But, you know, we forget that 10 years ago, computers weren't nearly as good at identifying things like this as they were before. There's famous examples of, you know, uh, uh, the computer thinking that um, a dog is a particular husky breed. Why? Because of uh, its ears or its eyes? No, but because it's in the snow, you know? And, and we, we've learned that computer vision makes those kinds of mistakes. So ImageNet was created basically to allow machines to practice at computer vision, but it's also a competition, a competition to allow academics and researchers to test their abilities against this data set. So it's a database and it's a competition. And that leads us to something that as uh, product managers and leaders in project man uh, product management, you're gonna encounter this mythology, okay? That computers learn like, uh, you know, babies or like puppies that 
all the data scientist does is turn the machine on and then step away to get their coffee or have a, um, a nice casual lunch. And when you come back from your lunch break, the computer is better than it was when you left. Um, and I think all of us in the industry will sometimes encounter um, senior management, for instance, that has heard of this kind of thing and expects AI and machine learning to be magic. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, say this in a negative way. It's just that if you're being fed that through news, through LinkedIn, through research reports, through even conference presentations, and you get the notion that it's this way, then when development time is longer than is expected, or you're trying to add a new feature to an app or some software, and things get bogged down and more complicated, you might be constantly trying to explain to senior management, you know, it's not as magical as it sounds like in the news. Well, where is this magical thinking coming from? I've had a theory for some time that folks are confusing traditional machine learning and now deep learning with reinforcement learning. So what's reinforcement learning? We're, we're gonna be focused primarily in this talk on supervised learning, but I wanna clear this up right off the bat that what we're doing is not reinforcement learning. So what's the difference between reinforcement learning, which can sometimes seem a bit magical, and supervised learning, which is what the vast majority of the work, traditional deep learning, computer vision, autonomous vehicles, all of that, the vast, vast majority is supervised learning, but we sometimes hear about reinforcement learning in the news. So what's this other one? What's this other one called reinforcement learning? Well, reinforcement learning is the most famous for its association with games. This goes back to Arthur Samuels, a famous researcher in the 50s. I mean, before I was born, uh, you know, a uh, long time ago, mid-century of last, uh, uh, mid-century last century, uh, Arthur Samuels taught uh, the computer how to play checkers and basically just taught it the rules. And what happens in reinforcement learning is you navigate in this environment of the chessboard or of tic-tac-toe or of checkers or more recently of Go, um, uh, fascinating, uh, you know, game. Uh, if you haven't seen the documentary on AlphaGo, you should, it's fascinating. But all of these do start with basically just explaining the rules and allowing for experimentation. But imagine if an autonomous vehicle were to learn how to navigate streets by hitting a utility pole or hitting a curb or worse, it, as its method of learning how to drive down the road. You can see that it doesn't fit all these different application areas, but it's really a fascinating topic and everybody thinks that games are a lot of fun. So you encounter this with chess and with Go and so on. And I think a lot of folks think that all of machine learning will work, works like this, where you just teach it the rules and it learns on its own, again, like babies or puppies. That's really not the reality though. The reality is, is that we're really doing supervised learning. So how, what does supervised learning need to do its job? The quick version is a ton of data. So supervised learning is why databases like ImageNet exist. Supervised learning algorithms are hungry for supervised labeled data and lots of it. So ImageNet is created to support this exact purpose, but remember ImageNet is not just a database, it's also a competition. And starting in 2010, academics, researchers were all invited to compete in this competition. In 2012, three years into this competition, everything changed because a gentleman by the name of George Hinton came along who had been doing this for decades. He would be kind of Professor Emeritus age, you know, now he looks younger than he is, but I think he's probably around 70 or 70-ish, actually, I probably shouldn't be guessing somebody's age, but I just from the length of his career, I'm, I'm making that guess. So he's been doing what we now call deep learning all this time. So why is deep learning kind of a new name for something that's not incredibly new? Well, because it wasn't really considered ready for commercial application until after 2012. So what was this big change in 2012? Well, George Hinton's team, he's uh, at University of Toronto, I believe. So it would have been him and his postdocs and his uh, graduate students competing here. This is what it looked like. So 
this chart is a little bit um, surprising in some ways. I found this on the web. I think it's a very powerful chart, but I want to orient you to it because lower is better. And a lot of charts, higher is better. Like we, we, know we want high revenue, right? But in this case, bars are error. So we want low error. Lower is better. Also, the past is on the right and the present, uh, closer to the present is on the left, which is a little surprising too. But anyway, in 2010 and 2011, the neural nets that won this image net image recognition competition were what we might now call shallow neural nets. Uh, if you want to guess what they were called before 2010 and 2011, they were just called neural nets because before 2010 and 2011, all neural nets were shallow because when I first encountered neural nets in the late 90s, I would have been early in my career and, and still in my 20s when I encountered neural nets in my uh, uh, in the late 90s. But at the time we were told in no uncertain terms that you basically should have one hidden letter layer in an unusual complex circumstances, you might have two. So one or two was the norm. So when, and it was that way for decades. So when Hinton's team won in 2012 with eight layers, it was a big deal. It has changed so much since then. We have gone through such revolutionary change that you could be forgiven to think, I don't get why going from two to eight is such a huge deal, but it was a huge deal. Notice as well that the height of the bar is roughly cut in half between 2010 and Hinton's team's efforts in 2012, efforts for which he shared the Turing Award a couple of years later with two other very famous researchers. The Turing Award is kind of the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in computing. It's, a, it, it's also a very big deal. So the error rate was cut in half and the number of layers dramatically increased, starting from here, then going to eight layers, again, a true revolution, and then look in the upper left of the slide by 2015, two amazing things had happened. This is how quickly things changed. Between 2010 and 2015, two unbelievable things changed. The error rate got incredibly low compared to what it had been before, to the point that by 2015, the error rate was better than humans. That's amazing, all by itself. And notice that the number of layers went from decades of it being one or two to eight, and then 152. And then something that's so recent that I don't have a slide for it here is that just a couple of weeks ago, I was reading that Microsoft has developed uh, some hardware technology capable of fitting 32 trillion parameters. So if you are a linear regression person, and I gather that, uh, that I, I would imagine that most of you are familiar with, uh, with linear regression, and linear regression and neural nets aren't as different as they, as they seem at first. Neural nets obviously are complicated. They allow you to, it's almost like adding polynomials to your regression. You know, it allows you to handle complexity and curvilinearity and all kinds of fancy things. But if you think in terms of regression and you've got five predictors and regression, you only have five predictors and five what's called beta coefficients. Well, these 32 trillion, that's with a T, trillion with a T, 32 trillion parameters would be like having something vaguely like having 32 trillion beta coefficients in a regression. I mean, it's just mind boggling, even to me. And I was looking into this just a couple of uh, days ago when I saw that article and the state of the art uh, 15 months ago, I guess was 17 or 18 billion. So think about that. It is mind boggling. 17 or 18 billion parameters a year and a half ago to 32 trillion. Unbelievable. Orders of magnitude. Mind blowing. Right. So this all started. This revolution started really in the wake of Hinton's team winning this competition. So what does that mean about human in the loop? What even is human in the loop? Right. We're ready for that transition to, to introduce, uh, you know, the, the real theme of the talk now having laid down this foundation, because given all this revolutionary change, deep learning is hungry for data. So what human in the loop is, is using human labor, thus human in the loop, human labor to either increase the size, completeness, or accuracy of our supervised learning uh, data sets. So in other words, 
if you don't have Im the ImageNet database, how do you go about getting it? You get it by having humans label the images. And then once that, once that database is built, but you must build it first, then you teach the computers how to do it as well. So that's human in the loop. Increasing the size, accuracy, or completeness of our supervised machine learning data so that deep learning can happen. And Andrew Eng, who's a famous uh, data science educator and data science thought leader, describes it in this way, that if you're going to have a rocket, if you're going to have a very big rocket, big rockets need a lot of fuel. And to use this metaphor, deep learning, uh, a large complex network, like the unbelievable 32 trillion parameters that I just mentioned, that's a huge rocket. Huge rockets need a lot of fuel. And the fuel is the data. And that's why we need human in the loop, because the data comes from humans. Now, if you're wondering something uh, at right now, you might be wondering the same thing I was wondering five, six years ago when I first started hearing all the buzz about deep learning, because I'm not, I'm not an academic researcher at an elite institution. I'm a practitioner. Okay, so I'm, he I'm always hearing about this stuff about a year or two after the academics do their papers and I go to a conference and that's how I get to hear about it. So I'm, I'm a couple of years delayed from the um, academics. So I started really hearing about deep learning more like 2015 or so. And already it was really influencing things. You might've been thinking, well, why? what's going on that's so new? Well, we've said part of the story already, but the other part that might not be clear is the difference between structured data and unstructured data. So the kind of data that needs humans to label it isn't all data. In fact, for many of you, you're going to be working in industries like the industries I've been working with, uh, working in before Cloud Factory, like insurance, manufacturing, um, uh, banking, right? Where does that, or cell phone is a great example. Where does the cell phone data come from? It comes from me using the phone. No, there's no human labeling going on there. All the phones are being captured. They're in a bill somewhere. They're sitting in a computer somewhere. And the data scientists can go into that data and determine if I would save money if I was on an international plan or something like that. There's no human coding, it's human labeling rather, to allow that to happen. That's already structured data. The data is structured just because I'm using my phone every day. In contrast, we have the dogs and the cats and the autonomous vehicles and the drones flying through neighborhoods to make deliveries, that data has to be labeled. And you might have some vague sense of what this is like, like people drawing bounding boxes around stop signs to say, hey, that's a stop sign, but this other sign is a yield sign or something like that. That's what requires the human effort. So industries with supervised data like phones don't need human in the loop, at least much, much reduced degree. Autonomous vehicles, drones, computer imaging, facial recognition. This is where human in the loop is a really key first step in creating those very large data sets. Again, using the metaphor, it's the fuel to allow the very big rocket to get off the ground. But the next theme that I would like to talk to, so we've just defined human in the loop and we've explained why it's exploding in importance. So I, now I wanna pause for a moment and talk about a different aspect of human in the loop that doesn't get as much attention as the big rockets need big fuel. In other words, big deep learning neural nets need lots of data. There's another aspect as well, and that's basically um, exception processing. So what do we mean? Well. What we were just talking about was the design and build phase of machine learning. That's where the rocket and the fuel metaphor is the most important. The requirement for these huge, large training data sets that require humans as an initial step. But we also have to maintain these models once they exist. So uh, an example that I was uh, just in interviewing an industry expert about a week ago on this same topic, and somehow we got stuck on the following example, you know, that you could have um, footage driving down the road and you could get pretty good at identifying not only the path, but the trajectory of a deer. 
I happen to live in uh, North Carolina and um, I see deer in the yard all the time. And obviously that can become a, a real risk to drivers, especially at night if a, if a deer is crossing the road, right? But let's say you developed a, uh, a autonomous vehicle model on North American data, but then you were using it in Australia. Okay, this is an example that's actually quite serious, but has a, has a certain almost humorous aspect to it because you just kind of imagine in your mind the way deer move versus how kangaroos move. OK, and you could realize that the model would really run into trouble. That's kind of what we're talking about here is that once you launch the model, once the model is out there in the world, you can encounter some phenomena that are new and that the model aren't ready for. And that sometimes forces you to go back to the design and build phase and might allow uh, might force you rather to add to your data with particular edge cases or special instances. Right. But there's another form in which that happens as well. During the normal course of running the business, you may occasionally encounter these exceptions and it's not cost effective to go back to design and build, but rather you want to utilize this managed workforce in real time or near real time to help the model out. So something that a lot of folks don't know is that Google employs tens of thousands of people. Ten, huge groups of people. Now, I'm not a, a specialist in particular in search or in Google, you know, as a company, but this very large workforce internal to Google um, is there to help refine search. So when you do a search and you don't choose the top choice, or let's say you have to go to the second page, there's someone manually looking at that and trying to refine and optimize. So there is not just a human in the loop, but tens of thousands of human in the loops, even with something that we think of as completed technology, like we all trust Google search in our everyday lives. Little do most of us know that it's constantly being refined and that refinement involves an army of humans, right? So what form might that take in a practical example, let's say like insurance? Well, James Taylor is a gentleman that I interviewed in a interview series that I've been doing with, uh, with Cloud Factory. And he was talking about a, why, uh, a disability claim example. And uh, specifically what it was is let's say somebody had a mobility issue that they were claiming you know, on disability. It might take a human to look at the doctor's notes or something like that to say, wow, is there something that indicates mobility here? The mention of ankle or knee or hip or leg, or maybe explicitly the word mobility, right? That's something that would take a human just a glance to confirm or disconfirm, right? And you're not making the decision just based on that. You're just adding this additional piece of information. Is there anything regarding mobility in this brief paragraph that I have to read? A human can do that very quickly. For those of you that have ever played around with natural language processing, I think we all recognize it's a lot harder than we give it credit, right? I mean, there's an enormous strides been made and maybe we can talk to our Amazon Alexa device pretty successfully, but it's tough work. You know, so sometimes it's just more cost effective to add in this piece. Now, notice you're not making the human the judge of the whole system. The human rather is providing a missing piece of information that goes back into the whole production system. And that's what folks like James recommend. So as he points out, it's crazy not to do this because you're solving an immediate problem, but you're also labeling data. So you're addressing the deploy and operationalize issue, but you're also providing what you need to go through an eventual refine and redesign process as well. You're getting two benefits at the same time, but that's not what most people do. What most people do is they, they postpone deployment. And I think as future product leaders, you could really appreciate this, right? Where sometimes you're always trying to decide, do we launch now or do we wait? Well, James is really saying, don't delay, launch now because you'll never be perfect. So launch, and you know this is the classic uh, build the plane while we fly it kind of a thing, but we, what he's saying is that if done right, it is the best approach. So what does this look like in practice? Well, you would think something like optical character recognition is completely solved. Computer scientists have been working on this with considerable success since the 80s. I really do believe the late 80s was when we started to get early indications of like reading checks. 
um, you know, processing checks or the postal service here in the U.S. being able to read zip code, including like handwritten zip code. This is what people have been working on this for decades. But still, things will happen. In fact, I don't uh, even know, for instance, how well OCR can handle something like a coffee stain on a meal receipt. I imagine that's a challenge. Certainly different uh, characters throughout the world, uh, you know, uh, we're looking at uh, English English uh, language characters, and there's a lot of uh, non-English languages that share the same characters, but as you all know, that's not true of all languages, right? So you have all kinds of challenges with uh, with OCR here, but also things could be handwritten. Um, a gentleman uh, that I was interviewing recently was saying, you know, OCR can pretty successfully read the side of a medicine bottle. That's not That's not a big problem. But sometimes figuring out what number on the medicine bottle is the dosage and what number on the medicine bottle is the times per day is still tricky for machine learning and AI, right? AI and machine learning has no problem identifying the number three, but it sometimes has a problem with knowing if that's three milligrams or three times a day, right? That's still a problem today in 2021. So what you'll often have is humans, again, in the loop, not in creating a training data set, but in intervening in real time or near real time to add information that the machine just can't detect on its own. So the way that another expert phrases this is that, you know, human insight, human perception can, uh, often infer things that might not be readily available in digital form. So what you can do is you can do routing and triage where the AI is routing things to the machines that machines are good at and routing other items. This, by the way, has a name within human in the loop. This is called active learning. It's a big research area where you're routing some things to machines and some things to persons so that the AI can reduce the overall workflow but humans can focus on the ones that are hard for the machines. So an example of that might be uh, something like uh, social media, for instance. Again, this notion of inference, someone's mood or intent, still incredibly difficult for AI and machine learning, but a lot easier for humans. A, a brief aside, by the way, about the Cloud Factory. Um, we really try to uh, uh, attract folks that are doing this very challenging work. You know, there's a lot of training that's involved. Imagine that it's medical imaging or uh, images of agriculture. The more familiar you are, the more accurate it'll be. So we really try to create an environment where these folks are valued and want to contribute in this way over a long period of time. Okay. So in other words, we're not looking for, um, you know, a, a, a college student on their one week vacation, right? Which uh, if you're familiar with crowdsourcing of this same thing, sometimes somebody can just work on a project for a couple of days and that's it, you know, but we're really looking for folks to making more of a commitment uh, to it. So that, that all that colors or flavors, the kinds of projects that we take on. I only mention this because something that you may encounter that you would particularly associate with social media is you may have heard that there are folks that look, spend their whole day looking at, video content that's violent or pornographic in nature. And that's very stressful and fatiguing. So we just don't engage in that space. We never take on that kind of work. I only mention that because you mentioned social media and your brain might immediately go to that because that's something that's become important in social media to look for uh, violent or pornographic content, but we don't engage in those um, kind of projects. We just, uh, we just choose not to pursue um, that work. All righty, so now we're getting closer to when you're gonna find out how similar or dissimilar um, the poll results for our group here today in this larger group that was polled on um, LinkedIn. So what I wanna talk about now, and it will give you a big hint as to what uh, the, uh, the answers uh, you know, uh, uh, were on the poll you know, for a large audience is um, that human in the loop expertise is pretty rare. So if you answered, what is human in the loop? You are not alone. It's out there. It's important. It's increasing in importance. But even among data scientists, even among data scientists, uh, frankly, in elite, uh, elite programs, it's not something that everybody's familiar with. So what's driving this? Well, first, an, an expert, if you are interested in this topic and you want to discuss it, if you want to uh, explore it in depth, then I would recommend uh, Robert Monarch's book. Um, it's really the only book length treatment of the subject that I've encountered. I looked all over the place. So when I found that his book was 
was in, in press, uh, in, in the works rather, in coming out this past spring, uh, I included him as one of the interviews um, that, that we did. It's about 400 pages on just human in the loop. It's a, it's a bit technical in spots, uh, and 400 pages on anything is a commitment, but, it, uh, but I do recommend it um, highly if it's something you want to, uh, if you really want to understand the technical underpinnings of this. But what, what he says is, you know, straight out of school, uh, many people in data science roles just didn't learn anything. In other words, there's not a lot of classroom learning about this on the data side. And I think if you look at environments like LinkedIn Learning, where uh, I've been involved uh, for quite a few years, or um, platforms like Udemy and so on, YouTube, where a lot of us go for data science education, including myself, uh, all those platforms I've explored at one point or another for my own education. Uh, but if you go to those places, you're not going to you're not going to find a lot about human in, in the loop. OK, um, so perhaps what he's saying isn't that surprising. But when he, he says didn't learn anything about the data side, he really does mean human loop. He means the creation and maintenance of these large data sets. So why might that happen? Well, I think if we do reflect as consumers of this kind of education, I mean, after all, we're all here today because we're interested in uh, our data science um, educations. You know, so I explore these same venues. Um, what am I finding? I find mostly Python, right? Now, that doesn't mean that Python's not important. It is, okay? But you could, you could do 100 hours of Python training and never talk about human loop. So when you think about uh, master's programs, for instance, specifically in data science, an entire master program in, in data science, you probably won't have, not only would you not have a course in human in the loop, you wouldn't even have a lecture on human in the loop more than likely. And I have a bit of a front row seat for this because I'm in, I'm in meetings, I'm an external resource to UC Irvine. I'm not a professor, certainly. I'm just an instructor in their continuing ed uh, program. But I sit on the advisory board specifically for the certificate program and we talk about what to include. I've never heard anyone suggest that out of a six course certificate program or an eight course certificate program that there was room for a whole course or a whole even a, a whole learning unit on human in the loop and despite how important i think it is i don't know if it fits in something like a six course sequence because you got you have this other stuff that you have to do so although you're getting hands-on in the sense that you're actually writing code and learning Python and, you know, you start with hello world and you, you work your way up to, you know, simple models and so on, you're never going to get to the point where you have hands-on like I'm talking about now, hands-on like Usama Fayyad, who's a famous uh, person in this space, uh, a name that I'm sure you possibly are not familiar with, but he helped coin the phrase knowledge discovery and databases and was one of the co-chairs of the original KDD conference, which is now 25 years old conference, right? So super influential, I mean, a true pioneer. And the way that he puts it is we need apprentice-based learning because, you know, learning all this code doesn't really teach you. It, it, gives you the, it gives you the tools and the toolkit. It doesn't give you the broad application. So he uses a metaphor that I just love that we need something like a doctor's residency. And I just think that's a brilliant metaphor. You know, apprentice-based learning. You get your medical degree and then you become a resident of a hospital. And I love that, I love that metaphor. That could work in a whole bunch of different areas, but certainly data science and machine learning. So here we go. Let's compare our numbers. So now realize that the numbers that you're looking at on the screen was either followers of me or followers of followers of me, right? So it was somewhat more of a general audience. Whereas today, you all showed enough interest in this topic, human in the loop, that you came today, right? So you would expect that the what is human in the loop number is lower today than it would be in this more general audience, which indeed it was, right? Uh, you all, uh, if the, the numbers were changing, but I wrote down 29% was the number that we got today. And in the broader LinkedIn audience, it was uh, a 48, right? But if there's any answer in here, that's kind of like the right answer, because in a sense, this isn't really opinion, right? It's really kind of more of a um, assessing one's familiarity with the topic. I think now that you've seen three-fourths of the talk, more than three-fourths of the talk, 
I think you'd agree that critical for some applications is probably what we might call the right, right answer. It's an absolute requirement for autonomous vehicles, for drones, for all these other areas, but you might not encounter it in banking or insurance or manufacturing. So critical for some applications is probably the right answer. But I, I, what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to ask this is, uh, what is uh, do you know what human the loop is? Yes or no, because I wanted a richer set of data. But I think, um, I think these numbers are pretty darn close. Uh, you all said five and on LinkedIn, it was uh, you know uh, 6%. Again, a lot of people have heard of it. They have some familiarity with, with it, but because they're in banking or insurance and manufacturing and so on, they don't need it. And that makes a lot of sense. It's really structured data, unstructured data, right? So the final point I wanna make, make about expertise is that if you do this on a thousand images, um, 2000 images or more, you develop an expertise that even a subject matter expert doesn't have, right? And this is what I found so fascinating and frankly was the main reason that I got uh, really excited about joining Cloud Factory was this one fact. I said, wow, if that's true, I am so fascinated in this process and I wanna learn more about it. A veteran data annotator looking at something like medical imaging will sometimes be more accurate and more efficient at it than a subject matter expert like a medical doctor. Now, clearly the medical doctor knows things that the data annotator doesn't know. But what's less clear is over the course of many months and thousands of examples, the data annotator develops a level of expertise in the data annotation task that a medical doctor that's not familiar with machine learning and data annotation doesn't have. So they are complementary kinds of expertise. And this is sufficiently important that you really need a feedback loop from your data annotators back to the subject matter experts when you think about your refine and optimize phase of the machine learning life cycle, okay? So this is a, real, this is a really big deal. And it surprised me when I first heard it, but it didn't shock me. And the more I reflected on it, I think it's a key fact about this. So let me try to give you a tangible example so you can get a feel for what this is like. Over time, the data annotators were able to meet the client's KPI of 45 images an hour. Now I can tell that the posture on the left isn't as good as the posture on the right, but that's not what they would be doing. They would be drawing like bounding boxes around this, be a whole elaborate set of uh, things that they would be doing to these images, looking for very specific things. They're not just saying good posture, bad posture kind of a thing. They're doing much more than that. And to do that 45 times an hour requires a speed that again, a, me a medical doctor might notice things like, for instance, a medical doctor might notice something about um, this person's um, orientation of their feet or their ankle, which might not even be part of the task. But a medical doctor might notice things that go beyond the task, right? But the data annotator is probably faster and might notice things that are anomalous, saying, wow, in a thousand images, I've never seen an image quite like this one before. So again, you have this complementary expertise. It's very interesting. So I want to close and start thinking about Q&A, everybody, because I want to switch over to Q&A within the next five minutes. Um, uh, now I want to talk about just kind of a, a couple of fun application areas that are in this space where machine learning and AI are important and where human in the loop is important, too, in creating these very large data sets. So my first example is reducing pesticide by knowing exactly where in a plot of land uh, pesticide is needed, okay? Uh, and again, we'll be switching over to Q&A uh, in about uh, four minutes, uh, three or four minutes, okay? So what does this look like? Well, notice how the, uh, you know, where, you, where the boundaries around the leaves on the right have been clearly indicated. You know, something that actually computer vision still has a tough time with, and I think as, as humans looking at this, we would feel the same way. It's not that easy to count the leaves. Now that's not the task here. The task is not to count the leaves, but if you can't tell where one leaf ends and the next leaf begins, that is part of the task. And again, notice this is uh, less than 30 minutes an image, average of 15.3 minutes per image. Now I don't know exactly what the task is, but I believe it is making sure that the leaves are individually 
defined, right? Because then what you're doing is the machine learning is there to help you say, this plant has a certain amount of disease and this other plant doesn't so that you can efficiently use the pesticide. But you see what I mean? This is not, this is not trivial stuff. So there are folks that do um, crowdsourcing to do human in the loop, where basically they give a paragraph of instruction, they farm that out, and then people will, you know, um, I'm not an expert really in that industry, but they'll bid on, you know, what they're willing to, you know, get paid for that kind of thing. That's not, um, that's not the market that Cloud Factory is in. We're doing a managed workforce. So folks are doing a day or maybe a week of training and then staying on that task, a task like this of the leaves for six months or a year or more, right? And that's where, where you really get that level of expertise. So it's, um, I'll be candid. I, I don't know if I would be very good at it because I don't think I'd be good at detailed perception work um, like that. But clearly, you do this thousands of times. You're developing a skill set and a knowledge about the subject that you didn't have when you started. Right? What about in retail? I think we all know about uh, automated or semi-automated checkout. But you know, another application area. In fact, it was a an earlier role for the gentleman that I interviewed last week was um, using AI to go into the grocery store and identify what item you are pointing the camera at, which is an incredibly powerful thing for uh, the vision impaired. So someone might have enough vision to navigate the aisles and so on and pick up what, you know, is a can of soup, let's say, but not be able to read the label, you know. So uh, having a phone app that recognizes that this is a peach and this is a nectarine or something like that, very, very powerful. Um, application area of computer vision in retail, not uh, in one that perhaps is not as famous as automated checkout. Uh, this one's a lot of fun. Uh, and we may even want to talk about uh, uh, this kind of thing in Q&A if anybody wants to hear more about this. But one expert in particular that I interviewed thinks that what's going to happen is that autonomous vehicles are going to increase the amount of time that we spend as pedestrians on city streets. He happens to be an expert in smart cities. So the image on the right is um, an image from uh, Denver. I don't know uh, if any of you have ever happened to visit that uh, city. Denver is a fun place. I haven't been there for years. I used to go about once a year uh, to uh, teach a class. But that bus is a, is a free bus and there's no cars on this particular street in Denver. It goes about 10 or 12 blocks. And that way you just park your car and you go up and down and up and down and you do all your shopping and then you return to the parking lot and you get your car. That kind of thing is gonna increase. And the reason it's predicted to increase is that autonomous vehicles, strangely enough, are gonna increase the amount of time that we walk because if you can call the car to you anytime you need it, then the whole idea of parking garages and the whole idea of how we use our cars might change because you might get dropped off by your car, your car, depending on how far you live the, from the store, the car might even bring itself home, right? And then not have to be in a parking garage. Then you do all your shopping, you have your shopping bags, you call the car back, you call your car back with an app and you go home. It's just gonna change the way we think about when we walk and how we do shopping, you know, it's fascinating. So, as Jonathan uh, Reichenthal points out, another book I recommend, by the way, he's written a book on uh, smart cities for dummies. If uh, in your product leadership role, it has anything to do with how we live in cities, um, brick and mortar retail versus online retail or transportation or any number of huge things. I mean, uh, how many things are not connected to how we live in cities Then I'm sure you will enjoy his book. He's making the prediction that if you have a, a very young person in your life, like two or three years old or younger, they may never buy a car. And that's because he believes that autonomous vehicles are going to be more in the public sector than the private sector, at least at first. Okay. Well, Paris uh, apparently is uh, thinking something along those lines. The famous Champs-Élysées. Uh, I included the, the night picture there so you can really get a sense if you haven't walked it, which is, a, a, I think, on probably most people's bucket list. It's a beautiful place to be. But uh, if you've ever you know, waited at a, a pedestrian crosswalk to cross the Champs-Élysées, it is out of control how busy the traffic is. Um, you can see the number of lanes quite clearly, I think, in the night shot. Now, on the right is what the French 
have been calling a journée sans uh, voiture, a day without cars, but they're going to make it permanent. And the Champs-Élysées is going to be permanently closed to vehicle traffic so that it'll be just pedestrian traffic, which is really fascinating, right? So just like Denver, right? But, but, but a much, much bigger area, and they're going to plant trees down the middle and, and so on, right? So again, he's, uh, he's making the prediction that if you have a young child in your life, that they may never buy a car. He thinks that the number of cars in the world has already peaked, that over time it will go down. Now, he's not saying that car manufacturers are going out of business or something like that. He's hardly saying that because gas fuel cars are going to get replaced with electric and cars with steering wheels will eventually get replaced with autonomous vehicles that have no steering wheel and all these changes, right, are going to take place. But he is predicting that um, in terms of the fact that, you know, there's uh, folks that have more than one car per person, even, you know, like a small little car for the city and a big car that they use to go camping with the kids or whatever, right? He, he just thinks that the total number of vehicles in the world has actually peaked and we're going to get different kinds of vehicles and a different kind of ratio between people and vehicles. He's one expert with one opinion, but uh, an interesting one. So those are kind of the key takeaways. And uh, Abulash, I'd like to start taking questions. I've been kind of monitoring sure. the count of them a little bit. I guess we're some in chat and some in Q&A. Yes, yes, Kate, sure. Uh, thank you so much, Kate, for that wonderful session. You know, it, I think it's found it very insightful and helpful, not just to understand the concept around human in the loop, but I think you mentioned a couple of applications, right? So uh, I think apl application in autonomous vehicle and treating some psychological disorders or even optimizing some herbal apl herbicide application, right? So it almost feels like magical and just yeah. to understand the true future potential. So yeah, that, that was great. And I hope even the audience must have found it very informative. I see Thank you. quite a few questions. So let's, you know, I'll, I'll take, uh, I'll talk through the questions and if you can help them answer. Oh, uh, so the um, first, sorry, say that. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So the first question is, uh, do you recommend any general, so that's coming from Pravind. He says, do you recommend any general frameworks, open source tools, information source to improve model learning, utilizing human input post model deployment? Um, I have two, I have two recommendations, Praveen, on, on this. Uh, one is I really, if, if you want to get deeper into this and really understand how it works, you know, under the hood, so to speak, I definitely recommend Robert Monarch's book that um, it's uh, by a publisher named Manning. It's uh, Human in the Loop Machine Learning is the title because um, he actually has some, some tools that he's written that are open source that he talks about in the, in the book and tells you where to find them and so on. And there's a GitHub for the book and the whole nine yards. So that's definitely a big recommendation. Um, another uh, recommendation that I would make is the gentleman that I was um, interviewing last week has a machine learning platform that supports machine learning algorithms, but also specifically data labeling and data annotation. And they have a really good website and that's called V7, V as in vector seven, or sometimes it'll be phrased V7 labs. His name is Alberto Rizzoli by the way, and um, on the Cloud Factory website, you can see the interview that I did with him. I didn't quote him on the slide because I interviewed him less, uh, only about uh, 10 days ago. But Alberto Rizzoli, V7, and Robert Monarch, Human in the Loop Machine Learning. Right. I hope that answers for you, Praveen. Uh, yep. The next question we have is, what do you do at Cloud Factory to help manage boredom, fatigue of the workers and keep them motivated? Well, one well you know, I, I happy. Sorry, uh, some more no, no, I, I happen to be reading, and I, I love the, I love oh, the question. So, right. I, I, so I, that's I was from getting, Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That, that, sorry to interrupt you, but I was enthusiastic about the question. Yeah, I don't work as closely with these folks as I would like, partly because of my newness at Cloud Factory, because I'm learning, uh, you know, so many things about it. But of course, I've been part of conversations, and I've seen a video interviews with them, and I really hope uh, someday soon to visit Nepal in um, Nairobi, to visit, you know, those offices. As you can imagine that during COVID, things that had been happening in the office have been moving 
um, home. So think about think about all the implications there. It's unbelievable. You've got data security and all kinds of things that have happened. So this has been kind of dramatic time for you know Cloud Factory for that reason. But one thing to keep in mind is that we're very supportive of flexible hours. So um, you know you you want to be picturing something like twenty hours a week, not sixty. You know, and very often I I love this too. Quite a few of the folks that are in this data annotation role are getting um, their uh, college and graduate degrees while they do this, which is also, you know, to supplement the kind of part time. So that kind of flexible hours really helps with this uh, because it's the only way, frankly, to avoid that stress and fatigue that you anticipate here. Um, and if they are really treated as part of the corporate family, and they're treated well and supported, it is so much more important that they stay for many months or many years. Um, and one of the things that I found incredibly interesting was that younger, you know, like brothers or nephews and so on would say, wow, when, I, uh, when I'm old enough and have enough uh, schooling to do this, I want to uh, do it. It becomes almost like a family business, uh, you know, kind of, a, uh, kind of a thing, right? So if you nurture that environment, then you keep folks in this role for much longer. And that ultimately uh, is what brings the value to them, to Cloud Factory and to Cloud Factory's clients. Awesome. The next question, Keith, is from Rajan. He says, deep fakes have been major concern. I wanted to know how can human in the loop help in avoiding the problem of deep fakes? This is such an interesting question. I. I don't know that, I don't think I have a good answer because my fear would be is that the deep fake data, what you wanna think of too is that as fascinating a question as it is, um, it's gonna be the kind of thing that becomes important to an organization like Cloud Factory when we have a client that's working on this, right? So I don't know, I know that it's something certainly that people are exploring. I don't know if there are startups yet that specialize in this issue. But the other thing that would concern me is, is that deep fakes can be so convincing, at least to me, how do you make sure that the human in the loop isn't fooled by the deep fake? You see what I mean? It's a different kind of a task than the uh, medical imaging or the agriculture or the delivery drone in that the ground truth, as it's called, is clear. Here it's not clear sometimes what the ground truth is. So that's the part that I would have to reflect on, but it's a fascinating question. Thanks, Keith. Uh, and with you know time constraint, I'm just going to take the last one. Uh, so the last question is from Vian. Uh, he says, he or she says, what should be the system trigger to involve human in the loop intervention? Ah, a really, really important question. Yeah. So what you end up doing is you end up using machine learning in two senses. You use the machine learning to process cases that the machine learning is capable of, but you also use machine learning for the triage, for the routing. So you, you end up having to use machine learning in two ways. And that routing uh, is called active learning. And there must be like 150 pages on active learning in Robert's book because it's a it's a really important topic. But it's actually using the computer to to do this. The, the over time, the computer can learn what is what should get sent to the human and what should get sent to the machine, and it won't always be right. And when it's wrong, that it all creates a feedback loop. Yeah. So that process of deciding is called active learning. Keith, I see some more interest coming in. Would you mind taking one more question? Sure, sure. Go ahead. So there's a question from Ramesh. There's also issue of unconscious bias that humans may have sometimes, which may result in mislabeled data. How do you implement quality control given that? Super important question. This is also, this is also something that gets multiple chapters in, uh, in Robert's book because there's some very specific math that you're doing around this. It's not unlike A-B testing. So when, especially if the data is noisy or fuzzy or the ground truth is not entirely clear, one of the things that you might do, which I think we'd all intuit, is you might have more than one human apply the label 
And if two humans agree, that's a good sign. And if the two humans disagree, that's kind of a bad sign. So especially while you're still in the prototype and refinement phase, you might have a situation where a subject matter expert, like a medical doctor is involved as well as a data annotator or more than one data annotator. And as the system gets more sophisticated, you're getting faster and you're scaling up. But early on, the quality control is super, super important. And you're constantly running all this math to see about agreement between labeling and ground truth when that's known or between two labelers or between a label and a subject matter expert and so on. So there's a lot of double work to address this precise issue. Awesome. Cool, Keith. Uh, I think, yeah, that's, that's all for tonight. And I think it was, it was very insightful. And thank you so much, Keith, for this. It was a pleasure to host. Before you wind up, uh, Bilaj, I'd like you and Keith, either of you, to pick the winner. As I uh, mentioned earlier, he'd be rewarded with the Taylor Scholarship. So please go ahead and pick the winner for uh, the best question award. I would probably like uh, Keith to do the honors. Okay, that's... Oh boy, this is so, I mean, all the questions. I think all the questions are equally good in terms of the fact that they're insightful to the topic and I think produced a really good Q&A. So I'm going to, since I'm forced to choose, I'm going to go with uh, Ramesh because um, I think that's such an important issue about um, the fatigue of the workers and treating the workers well. Um, and um, without that question, it might not have come up in conversation. And uh, well, you could tell from my enthusiasm because I started answering that one before uh, before you uh, were able to finish reading it. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. So, so on that basis, uh, based on my enthusiasm about the question, uh, we'll, we'll choose Ramesh, but you all asked uh, very helpful questions. Yes, uh, perfect. Congratulations, uh, Ramesh, on winning the Taylor Scholarship and for the great question that you asked. And we'll get in touch with you with the reward shortly. Well, I had a lot of fun. I enjoyed today. I enjoyed when I was able to do this event in the in the past. So it's I want to thank you so much for the repeat invitation. Yeah. yeah. And thank Wonderful. you so much for the brilliant and engaging session. Uh, so uh, please accept this certificate of appreciation from the Institute, a small gesture for your effort and insights drawn from your research in industry. I'm sure the audience have learned a great deal about the new and you know trending concept of uh, human in the loop AI, and we'll learn further from you in the upcoming right. keynotes. Thanks so much, and I will uh, I will keep my eye on you know I encourage everybody to follow me on um, LinkedIn. Let me just uh, very briefly here. Oh, uh, do you mind if I just? share the final slide with uh with contact info just uh cloud factories sure. LinkedIn and so on sure. yeah yeah because also this will be helpful i think for folks that see the uh, recording so absolutely yeah. there we go so uh, my email at cloud factory cloud factories linkedin my LinkedIn is easy to find because I got lucky with LinkedIn. My LinkedIn is just Keith McCormick. Um, you don't need any numbers or underscores or anything like that. And then cloudfactory.com webinars. I want to especially mention that because if you were interested in any of the expert interviews, like maybe the one with Robert or maybe the one with Jonathan, you can find those on that, uh, on that website. If someone wanted to go deeper on any of those topics, whether it's smart cities or the technical issues around human in the loop or what have you. So again, people will be able to pause that in the recording if they do that, but that's, uh, anyway, I just had realized that we had never gotten to the final slide. So again, thanks. Uh, yep. uh, thanks thank you me. once thank again you for joining us. Yeah. Okay. And thank, thank you, Abhilash, for moderating this session seamlessly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shama. Yes, thanks. Thanks, 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 thanks Thank you. Cheers. Audience, we found Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. And audience, thank you for your enthusiasm and the questions that you asked. And if you found today's keynote useful, please take a few seconds to share your feedback, experience, and perspectives on this session. Your feedback is important to us and critical for us to make improvements in the upcoming editions of the festival. Please go ahead and scan the QR code and share your feedback. Thank you.
Thank you. And before we close, audience, this is a quick look at the session coming up on Monday. That is on the 15th of November. So this is going to be from Matangi Shri, who is the VP Data Sciences Gojek, and her uh, topic is going to be data-driven decision making from myth to reality. So not forget to attend this, and this is going to be your impactful session yet again. With that note and tonight's session, happy learning and stay skilled. Have a great night. Thank you all. Take care.